Well, folks, as you can tell, I brought North Carolina allergies with me. Uh, it's a, it's a, I don't know if congestion is a spiritual gift, but if it is, I'm a full-blown charismatic this morning. So there you go. Uh, you know, I, I love that reading from John's Gospel uh, that we heard this morning. I love the story of Thomas. And I want you all to do me a favor. Stop, stop hating on my friend Thomas. People just hate on him. They call him Doubting Thomas as if somehow he was different from all those other doubting men and women disciples. I don't think anybody was that full of faith uh, leading up to the crucifixion. And even after the resurrection, we hear about those two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And when Jesus was walking with them, explaining the good news about how Messiah had to suffer, die, and rise again, uh, they, they didn't believe it even then, not until the bread was broken and he was manifested in front of their eyes. So I don't think that Thomas is so much of a doubter as kind of a skeptic, as sort of a realist. In fact, I want to suggest that um, that that skepticism, I don't know, there's a, uh, earlier in John's gospel, I think it is, where uh, Jesus says, we've got to go up to uh, Jerusalem. And uh, and they said, uh, and they said, well, Lord, they were just trying to kill you there a few days ago. And Thomas said, well, let us go with him that we may die also. He's a real cheerful person, cheerful. Now, seriously, though, I think he's just a realist. I, I, don't think he's, I don't think he's a doubter. I think he cares about the truth. And I think that that kind of realism isn't uh, to be rejected. I think it's something that for Christians, it is a, in its proper place, it's something to be celebrated and embraced. And in the gospel lesson this morning, by the way, this is the literary climax of the gospel of John. All through John's gospel, uh, he has been, John uh, John has been obliquely making some outrageous and wonderful claims about Jesus, but they are finally said here openly, not by Peter, not by James, not by John, but by Thomas. In light of that, the scripture reveals to us this morning that that honest doubt, honest doubt can be positive, it can be a constructive force in the life of the Christian or the person who is struggling to become a Christian. Honest doubt, listen, is this. It's simply the passionate search for what is true and real. Honest doubt is the passionate search for what is true and real. The Scottish reformer, John Knox, wrote of a time when his soul knew, and this is his quote, anger, wrath, and indignation, which is conceived against God, calling all his promises in doubt. Increase Mather, one of that Mather crowd uh, of the great Puritan leaders in North America, wrote in his journal, greatly molested with temptations to atheism. Greatly molested with temptations to atheism. You know, we sing Martin Luther's great hymn, a mighty fortress is our God, and we might suppose that he never questioned his faith. But he once wrote, For more than a week, Christ was wholly lost. I was shaken by desperation and blasphemy against God. So, people who care passionately about truth, people who care deeply about investing their lives in what is real, are naturally going to be what some people see as doubters. They're going to test and examine truth claims that come their way. They recognize that life is just too precious to live devoted to a lie. And that's why we need a little, what I would call, holy skepticism. Now, I'm naturally a skeptic. I was born and raised in North Carolina. My people always have been in North Carolina. But I'm kind of like somebody from Missouri. Show me. Show me. I'm a little skeptical. I don't want to live my life based on some kind of fantasy But I have examined the true claims of Jesus Christ. I've gone as far down the skeptic hole as you can go. And I want you to know that after I have tested the the claims of Jesus Christ against archaeology, against logical cohesion, against the the reliability of God's Word, uh, against the test of history, against martyrs who have gone to their deaths proclaiming the goodness of God, and their faith in Jesus Christ, after going all through that, I have come away saying that there, that there is no other faith, no other faith like the Christian faith where my doubts have been fully satisfied. My doubts have been fully satisfied. I don't know if y'all heard about this, but uh, I don't know. Has anybody here know who Justin Brierley is? He's an English podcaster. 
Justin Briley. Well, anyway, he was interviewing uh, Richard Dawkins, used to be one of the four horsemen of the, uh, of the new atheist movement back in the 90s. I don't, somehow, it's hard to believe, but many of y'all weren't even alive back then. That's so funny. And to me, it's like it was yesterday. Uh, but anyway, uh, Dawkins, who was this new atheist dude, to say, well, you know, I've, I've decided I'm kind of a cultural Christian now, at least. I like the hymns. I like the Christmas carols. I don't want to live in a, uh, in a, a non-Christian culture. Even he has begun to see the value of the Christian faith. It's astonishing. It's astonishing. So there's some benefits to this kind of honest doubt. And I want to just go through these and maybe encourage you a little bit. First of all, honest Honest doubt keeps us from falling into error. Being gullible is not a Christian virtue. Credulity is not a Christian virtue. It's not a spiritual gift. There is, this is especially important when we deal with, with so-called Christian teachers and ministries. Uh, just because someone has had a popular YouTube channel, oh my gosh, a YouTube channel. That's like being the Pope now, having a popular YouTube channel or a blog, or somebody has written a book, it does not mean that he or she is qualified to have teaching authority in the church. The Bible clearly tells us to be skeptical about the teaching we receive until we have tested the source of that teaching against the scriptures and the apostolic tradition. Listen to 2 John, verses 7 and following. John writes, many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world any such person is a deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but you, you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. <coughs> Matthew chapter 7, watch out. Jesus says, watch out for false prophets. Be skeptical of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. 1 John 4, dear friends, do not, believe, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19, 21. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold to what is good. 1 Corinthians 12, 29. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. We need to take what someone says is from the Lord and apply the solvent of God's Word to it and see what is left behind. Somebody, somebody, I heard somebody say, oh, we were at the uh, service one time, and the Holy Spirit manifested himself as glitter. Really? Glitter? No, I don't believe that. I think you have been bamboozled. So honest doubt keeps our faith alive and active and stimulated. Fred, Frederick Beekner, a uh, great Presbyterian uh, Bible scholar, said, doubts are the ants in the pants of faith. They keep it alive and moving. My dad was uh, standing in the pulpit of an old Anglican church in Charleston one day, and there was a fire ant nest somehow right up under the pulpit. My dad, it was, he was not preaching. It was just he wanted to stand in that pulpit. I don't know if it was St. Michael's or one of the other uh, historic Anglican churches, in Char not this Charleston, the other Charleston. Not Charleston in Best Virginia, but Charleston in South Carolina. And those fire ants had crawled up in his pants. I mean, crawled up his sock, crawled up in his pants, and he started twitching. And his buddy was there. His buddy and his wife were there. My mom was there. Daddy had to take his pants off in church to get those fire ants off. I'm not making that up. Doubts will keep you alive and moving like that. And most importantly, honest doubt leads to even greater, deeper, more mature faith. Remember that I told you that the gospel lesson was the climax of John's entire testimony about Christ. But in the face of the resurrected Jesus, the doubter, the doubter makes the most astounding claim about Christ than any other disciple had yet made. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. We think Peter's profession, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Thomas goes even farther, you are my Lord and my God. 
This is the first open declaration of Christ's divinity, and it's made by, quote unquote, doubting Thomas. Now, there's a contrast to that, and that's dishonest faith, uh, dishonest doubt, and dishonest doubt is destructive. Dishonest doubt is really a disguise. Please hear this, okay? It's a disguise or a smoke, sp- a smoke screen people use to keep from having to accept the truth about the risen Jesus. And at the heart of dishonest doubt, this is so critical, at the heart of dishonest doubt is some other motivation than the search for truth. In fact, dishonest doubt is a means of avoiding the truth. Honest doubt is the quest to discern what is true and real. Dishonest doubt is a way of keeping God at arm's length. Former atheist turned Christian author, you've heard of him, Lee Strobel, perfectly describes dishonest doubt. At first, I had heartfelt and thoughtful objections to the Christian faith, but over time, after I began finding adequate answers to those issues, I started to bring up new and increasingly marginal challenges. He continues, doubts may actually be a subtle defense mechanism. They may think they're hung up over an objection to some part of Christianity when the reality is that they are actually just casting around for some excuse, any excuse, to not take Jesus seriously. Most often, dishonest doubt is a way of masking the fact that we don't want the God of the Bible to be real and true because if he is real and true, then we have to change our lives to match this reality. If we are people of integrity, if the God of the Bible is real and true, if we are people of depth and worth and logical consistency and reason and integrity, if the God of the Bible is real and true, then the only option for us at that point is to take him seriously and follow him and have our lives come into concord with his reality. Writing way back in 1937, Aldous Huxley wrote this. He said, for myself, as no doubt for most of my friends, the philosophy of meaninglessness was essentially an instrument of liberation from a certain system of morality. Hear that other motivation. We objected to the morality because it interfered with our sexual freedom. The supporters of this system claimed that it embodied meaning, system of meaning, the Christian meaning they insisted of the world. There was one admirably simple method of confuting these people and justifying ourselves in our erotic revolt. We would deny that the world had any meaning whatever. Dishonest doubt that is embodied in so much of what is going on right now. Are y'all, you've heard about people in the whole deconstructing their faith and ex-evangelical movement and that kind of stuff. So much of that comes from a ravenous desire to fit in with a new post-Christian ethos, a new post-Christian morality. It's not about genuine doubt. It's about feeling like you're on the outside. and Nobody wants to feel like they're on the outside. Face it, every day, our Christian beliefs, our ethics, our morality are more and more out of step with the spirit of the age. But finally, there is a time to stop doubting and believe. Listen again to Jesus' encounter with Thomas. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands? Reach out your hand and put it into my side. And then Jesus said this to Thomas. Listen to what he says. Stop doubting and believe. Stop doubting and believe. That seems odd, doesn't it? Jesus commands Thomas to stop doubting. He commands him to stop doubting. It's as if doubt is a decision And that Thomas has to make another decision, a decision to stop doubting and believe, as if it were an act of the will. And that's exactly right, because ultimately, once we have encountered the risen Christ and see him clearly portrayed as crucified and resurrected, victorious, we have to decide whether we will trust this Jesus 
or whether we won't trust him. Ultimately, it is a decision of the will. So let me ask you this. As Christians or non-Christians, do you have doubts about the claims of Jesus Christ? Serious doubts. Then by all means, honestly search for the truth. You need to go to the best, honest scholars who do not have an ax to grind or a motivation to keep the real Jesus at arm's length. There are a lot of scholars who do have an ax to grind. There are a lot of scholars who are, have spent their entire careers finding ways to not encounter the risen, true, living Jesus. But there are other scholars, and they tend to be the scholars of the highest caliber, like N.T. Wright, for example who have indeed found the gospel message to be true and reliable. Search those historical records. Examine the facts of the case. And after you do, you will come to realize that Jesus Christ is really alive. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And he is alive today, and he is still transforming lives. Uh, I've got to tell you a real quick, a real quick story. Uh, there's a young woman in our church. She's from a Cuban immigrant family. Her mom and dad grew up in, uh, as atheists in communist Cuba. They, they made it to the United States. They retained their atheist, atheistic beliefs. They're not believers. Uh, they do believe in Sateria, which, you know, go look that up sometime. That you'll find that's odd. You're an atheist and you believe in this uh, sort of uh, uh, pagan religion of Sateria. But anyway, she was raised in an atheistic household. And she was, this, this is in her senior year of high school, she started looking, she wanted to find a, co a coherent, reasonable, political philosophy. She was looking for a political philosophy. She wasn't a believer. And so as she began to study these things and uh, she began to read some books, she started going online and watching YouTube videos. This is so crazy. But anyway, she found that all of the things that she cared about, that she was looking for in a coherent political philosophy, she said, all that stuff came from Jesus. Love your enemies, you know, love your enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use you. Uh, care for the poor. All the things that she cared about, she said that she was finding that it was lining up with Christianity. So she went and started looking at uh, YouTube videos, some great Baptist YouTube videos, uh, Baptist evangelist apologists. And, and there in that atheistic household, by watching YouTube videos, she came to faith in Jesus Christ because she went down the skeptic's rabbit hole with sincere, honest doubt, and she found out that Jesus was alive. Well, she came to faith in Christ. She told her mama and her daddy, her atheist mom and daddy, and they were not blessed, not one bit, no. But she has started coming with some of her college uh, friends and roommates now to our church back in Winston-Salem. She's going to be baptized at Christ Church on Pentecost because she had honest doubt and it was time for her to stop doubting and to believe. Stop doubting and believe. So I want to challenge you this morning, today. If you are a skeptic about the truth of Jesus as revealed in God's word, I want you to doubt your doubt. Take a hard look at your doubt and ask yourself, am I motivated by real objections to the Christian faith or as I, am I using my doubt as camouflage for other motivations? Is my doubt camouflage for other motivations? There is good news. If you will take the risk and offer yourself in trust to Jesus Christ, you will immediately begin to see that faith validated as he comes into your life and begins a process of transformation. And the joy of finally receiving this risen Savior is such that in his presence you will fall on your knees in worship and exclaim, my Lord and my God. Stop doubting and believe. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.